I know this isn't very scientific, but it's worth a try. I'm trying to find out about the future of water in the Greater Victoria area. Hmm. I can't see much. I just see some black squiggles. Um, I think there are some words. It says it's uh, up to us? Um, it's up to us. Well, first let's gather the facts. What I've learned is that there are three major factors that will influence the amount and the quality of water we'll have available in the future. Population growth, climate change, and water conservation. First, let's look at population growth. Contrary to popular belief, our population is not growing at some wild exponential rate. Don't take my word for it. Here's the senior manager of CRD Regional Planning. Our population grows modestly. It's at around 1% per annum, and it has been that for quite some time. So why does it feel like we're having a whole lot of population growth? That's because the location of it is changing quite dramatically. The prediction is for a population of 420,000 in 25 years, an increase of approximately 65,000. That's what Calgary gets every two years, so that's a relief. Or is it? Now the problem we face, of course, is that in this kind of region, people move here because they're looking for the amenities for the lifestyle. We call it amenity migration. So what we're seeing is incredible demand for development in the areas all along, of course, all along the waterfront, because that's a wonderful place to live, um, into the more rural areas, and a lot more development now over along the whole west coast. What we are seeing is incredible cost of sprawl associated with that. It means we're putting growth into areas where we have to upgrade roads, we have to run new water pipes, they're extremely expensive, um, and that's just not efficient growth, nor is it very sustainable. The other issue we'd look at is in terms of types of housing is when people are, are moving out of condos, out of core kind of development that's very urban and getting into what we call ground oriented housing, kind of your conventional suburban or rural type of house, it comes with a lot of yard. And with a lot of yard, and of course this is a gardener's mecca, um, so people love to garden. That's very water hungry development in a time where we're seeing more and more drought into the summer. We're certainly seeing the average house size constantly expand. In the 50s, the average house size was about 1,100 square feet. New development now comes in over 2,500. With that comes a lot of bathrooms, uh, a lot of jacuzzis. We're seeing much more appliances. The landscaping has gotten a little more interesting in terms of a lot more water features. And so that really adds the cumulative impact of that is enormous demand on water. Another issue is that existing rural areas have become suburbanized as more people move there. Wells and septic tanks are not suitable in areas with a high population density, so they have to be upgraded with water and sewer pipes. That costs millions per kilometer. And in hilly regions, pumps have to be put in to move the water uphill, and that's costly from both an economic and environmental perspective. So what the CRD has done, we've developed a regional growth strategy and we brought that in in 2003 to look at how we want to manage growth over the long term. This is essentially what the mapping looks like and, so, and what this, all these squiggles mean is that this area that's colored in kind of brown is areas within what we call the urban containment boundary. And the objective in the growth strategy is try and direct as much growth as possible into these areas, including Sydney, and we chose these because they're essentially already serviced. So we want to make efficient use out of infrastructure, including water infrastructure. Climate change is now a certainty. In fact, a reality. You don't have to believe me. Here's what people in the know have to say. Jack Hall is General Manager of the CRD Water Services Department. We have over 100 years of rainfall records uh, in the Souk watershed area and we've had a group at uh, Brock University in Ontario do some statistical analysis of that to see if we can see what uh, changes are taking place over time. And up until about 1990, 
the r patterns were fairly cyclical, uh, almost like a sine curve. We got white, white periods, dry periods. Since the early 90s, we've seen much more volatility. We, we don't see that pattern that we've seen in the past. And that's one of the clear indications that climate change is here. It's happening. Trevor Murdoch is the Associate Director of the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. This graph shows temperature projections for the whole 20th century and 21st century. Because the climate system is so complex, uh, there are several different climate models that have been designed independently to simulate climate and to project the future. And they have different strengths and weaknesses, and so they have different uncertainty associated with them. Even despite that uncertainty, there are these things group together. So for temperature, there's differences between the different projections, but they're all on the warm side. So anywhere from about one to four degrees warmer than average uh, by the 2050s. Looking at the precipitation projections from several different models, by the 2050s, the average of the projections is almost 10% increase um, in, in the winter. Uh, many of the models actually show a decline even in the winter uh, projection. Looking at summer precipitation, all of the climate models show uh, a decrease in summer precipitation in this region. Um, the, the median is just, un, just around 20% decrease. A 10% decrease in precipitation during the summer might not seem like much, but as we get so little now, that 10% could mean drought happening much more frequently. Not just 10% of the time, but a whole lot more. Based on the information uh, that we've had on climate change, we're expecting uh, more winters like we had last year, which were some very intense storms, wind storms, lots of rain, which present problems in that we get lots of blowdown of trees in the, in the watershed. We get potentially turbidity, uh, cloudiness, silt in the water that can affect the water quality. Uh, so that's an issue for us in the long term. And then the second aspect of the long term is we're expecting to see longer, drier, warmer summers. So even though we may get more rain in the winter time, people are potentially going to use more water in the summertime. So that gives us a challenge in terms of making sure that there's enough storage of that winter rain to get us through the summertime. Uh, if we look at the uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, it's clear that we're now at a concentration where uh, we can't uh, completely turn around, although we need to do as much as we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we have less climate change to adapt to. Um, there will be some inevitable amount of climate change that we need to start planning for now. There are a lot of researchers working to understand the impacts of climate change, both globally and locally. Okay, this is a basic outline of the water balance components for the souk reservoir. So this shows us the, the inputs and outputs from the reservoir that result in the remaining storage. Hydrologist Aurelia Werner has been researching the impact of evaporation on water loss from the souk reservoir. This will help predict the reservoir water balance in the future. From the surface of the reservoir, there's also evaporation taking place. So all of the inputs and outputs result in potential changes in storage over the, over the year. Aurelia is one of a group of researchers with the Water and Climate Impacts Research Centre of Environment Canada. She is working out of the University of Victoria, one of the hotbeds of climate research in Canada. It is the combined research of scientists all over the world who are providing us new information about climate change and its impact. In fact, your school may be supplying information to climate researchers. Under the auspices of Dr. Andrew Weaver at the University of Victoria, over a hundred different weather stations have been put on schools around the southern part of Vancouver Island. This is one of them. Graduate student Chris Avis explains how it works. Each of these stations measures a comprehensive set of weather measurements. Most prominent is probably the anemometer, which measures wind speed based on the number of rotations of these cups here. And the wind vane orients itself in the direction of the current local winds. Here in this large kind of cylinder, we have our rain gauge instrument. If I remove this cylinder, you can see that it's a funnel, which funnels uh, any rain the instrument collects down into here, which is our tipping bucket rain gauge. Each of these little buckets fills up, and based on the number of tips we have here, it gives us an indication of the amount of rainfall we've experienced. 
on the top of the instrument here, we have two little instruments here which measure the amount of incoming sunlight as well as the amount of UV radiation, which is obviously important for those of us that are concerned about skin cancer and, and UV, UV levels. Within the instrument housing in here, we have a temperature uh, sensor as well as a humidity sensor and a pressure sensor. On this side of the instrument, we have the solar panels which recharge the batteries for the radio transmitter, which broadcasts the uh, weather station readings continuously to a station and then onto a website. Well, I bet you know what the next topic is, water conservation. The things we do every day influence our water supply. By making it a habit to conserve water in every way, every day, you'll help ensure that there's enough water for now and in the future. Waste not, want not, as my grandma used to say. I think it's like really nice that they've got the dead grass because I think it's really beautiful even though, yeah. you know. We've asked a group of high school students about water use. So I find that just the little things really add up and they really count. Like if you've got a glass of milk or something and you afterwards you want apple juice, you don't really need to wash the cup or get a new one. Because really if you did that about five times or something in one day and you had three family members, that'd be about 15 cups and fill up the dishwasher and mm -hmm. like a whole cycle, just things that weren't really used properly or enough. Um, my pet peeve is about when people, when they brush their teeth, they don't realize that sometimes they're leaving the tap on when they're brushing and all that water is getting to waste and they're not using it. So I think they should just turn off the tap and then brush their teeth and then turn on the tap when they need it and then turn it off. In the summertime when people decide that they want nice juicy grass in the, in the, when it's supposed to be not, not even green. They just like, the sprinklers will go all day long and waste so much water. Like friends and I like, will we'll take off our shoes and put on bathing suits and go sprinkler hopping because like, it's just constantly there. Mm -hmm. And they had so many super soakers, like giant ones like this big that you like pump up and they have like a pack attached to your back, like filled with water, and they go for about 20 minutes before they run out, which is like if that. like a gallon tank of water, like just like to shoot it at your friends. A lot of the time when my sister's having a bath, she lets the tap run and run and run, and just lets it drain out a little bit. She ends up spilling a lot of it on the floor, and I find it's just a really big waste. Like you look at people who live in other countries, like third world countries, and they like, they can survive off of almost like nothing which means that the potential is there to do that. It's just we are kind of spoiled and we have so much, uh, we have so many commodities that we end up using way more water than, than is our share. Mm -hmm. In the world, there's only like 3% fresh water in the world. And if we keep on like doing the stuff that we talked about, like leaving the showers on and like leaving the tap on, then we, that water's just going to go and then we won't have, it, have any fresh water. Fresh water will be the new gold, Yeah, eventually. Like I said, people don't even think about how much they need water because it's just always there and yeah. it's always on hand. So much water can be saved through just education. You can bet the CRD Water Department has a lot of programs to encourage water conservation. They have very successful rebate programs for people buying replacement toilets that are low flush and for washing machines that use up to 40% less water and 60% less energy than traditional top-loading models. They also use a lot less detergent. Moving outdoors, there are also rebate programs for irrigation timers and automatic rainfall shutoff devices. CRD Water Services also sponsors native plant workshops. Using plants that are adapted to our climate significantly reduces the need for watering. Watering lawns and gardens uses a huge amount of water in the summer, ironically at the time where there's the least water available. Believe it or not, people in our region use twice as much water in the summer. This is the Swan Lake Demonstration Garden in autumn. The gardening season was winding down, but the garden is still beautiful. Deborah Walker, Demand Management Coordinator at CRD Water Services, will show you around. Native and drought tolerant plantings are very beneficial for everyone. First of all, they conserve water. They are adapted to our climate. They are used to our warm dry summers and wet short winters. Here we see the wonderful Nutka Rose. Look at the rose hips. They make wonderful tea, also delicious jelly. As we move along, 
we can see the wonderful color from the red osier dogwood. Beautiful, great habitat for the little birds. Down here, we see the delightful little snowberry. Again, a good food for the little birds later in the winter time. Over here, we have the ocean spray. While it's not white and fluffy like it is later in the year, the little bush tits love the seeds. This is one of the remaining Gary Oaks in the province of BC. There are only 5% of the Gary Oak ecosystem left in this province. Because of development and the fact that property owners are weeding the seedlings out of their gardens or mowing them over, we have very few of these left. The arbutus tree is another unique feature of the southern tip of Vancouver Island. Notice how it drops its bark, but it keeps its leaves during the winter time. Very special. Native plant gardens are not only beautiful, but they also provide us with a sense of belonging, a sense of being in tune with the environment that we live in, in part because it's places like these that attract the native wildlife, which is adapted to this area. These native plants are also very meaningful to the Aboriginal people who have relied on them for food, shelter, and medicine. You might think that all these efforts you make personally to save water are just a drop in the bucket, not adding up to much, but that's not so. Total water use in the community is about the same as it was 10 years ago, despite all the growth that we've seen in the last five years particularly, and our water demand is pretty much the same as it was back in 1997. Well, do you remember what the oracle said? It's up to us. I hope that you can see that that's true now. It's up to each of us in the community to use water wisely. It will help us to weather climate change, reduce our energy and water use, and to preserve habitat for wildlife. Changing just a few small habits every day is all that's required. As for me, I'm giving up my 15 minute shower. I'm clean after five minutes anyway. But, hmm, this crystal ball is right. Maybe I should take up a career in fortune telling? What do you think? <laughs> Bye for now, but remember, be the difference, conserve water.